I'm being told that I can start again, so blame the organizers. Um, <laughs> Okay, so then some evidence that we are not totally off by thinking about monsoons through um, this convecti convective cause equilibrium framework. Uh, this is from Booz and Hurley, 2013. It shows from reanalysis the July climatology of the upper tropospheric temperatures here in the line contours and the moist static energy in the boundary or near the surface, um, at least for the South Asian monsoon, this coupling between high uh, moist static energy content and where maxima in upper tropospheric precipitation is well verified. Of course, let me, hear, let me try to emphasize here, of course, in the boundary layer, there is much more structure in the moist static energy than there is in the free upper troposphere, again, because in the tropics, you cannot sustain strong temperature contrasts. This coupling between uh, um, regions of moist static energy um, and uh, high moist static energy and higher or maximum upper tropospheric temperature in the North American monsoon is clearly not verified. Um, after I studied the North American monsoon as part of uh, my PhD thesis, I'm still doing a lot of work. And my advisor, Bjorn Stevens, uh, used to make the joke that I spent half of my career trying to convince him that the North American monsoon is a monsoon, and then the rest of my career convincing him that in fact it's not a real <laughs> monsoon. Um, I leave it at that. Um, so how about other time scales? So for instance, let's look at interannual time scales, especially for the focusing on the South Asian monsoon region. I don't have time to go into the details, but again, to reflect this uh, new way of thinking about monsoons, we have spent quite some time thinking about what are proper indices of monsoon strength. And so this is work from uh, Jennifer Walker, um, a student of mine who graduated last year, um, where we looked at the interannual variability of the South Asian monsoon. And we used uh, as a measure of the interannual strength uh, of the monsoonal circulation, the overall moisture flux uh, converging in this big box estimated from the reanalysis. And the, 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 the motivation being that the moisture budget tells us that if we can neglect transient storage effect, the net precipitation is equal to the, let me do it this way, the vertically, the convergence of the vertically integrated horizontal moisture flux convergence. So this quantity is strongly related to things that we care about, P minus C, e, net precipitation. In reanalysis, Q is probably not very reliable. But we show that on interannual time scales, fluctuations in the moisture flux are primarily due to fluctuations in winds. And so we said, well, probably this is reliable. Large scale winds are something that reanalysis are able to do. So again, interannual fluctuations in things that we care about in monsoon regions, which are not the winds, but their precipitation, are related to a quantity that is strongly constrained by the winds that we understand better then we understand moisture. And then based on this index, we started looking at regressions of all possible fields. This is what the temperature near the surface look like, looks like during the uh, summer monsoon season on average. This is climatology, again, higher temperatures. But then if we look at regressions, and this you can think as being your typical temperature anomaly near the surface associated with one standard, deviation, uh, a monsoon that is stronger by one standard uh, deviation, then you find that in fact strong monsoon years are characterized by colder temperature over the land and warmer temperature over the ocean. So if now you look at the overall near surface temperature gradient, the blue is the one strong monsoon years, the red is the one in weak monsoon years. Strong monsoon years are characterized by a weaker not a stronger meridional temperature gradient. Again, if you take the meridional temperature gradient as an external forcing driving the strength of the monsoonal flow, based on that temperature gradient, you would say, ha, huh, that year is a weaker monsoon year. In fact, it's a stronger. If you look at moist static energy, in fact, you find the opposite. Moist static energy gradients are stronger in strong monsoon years, and they're all driven by positive anomalies in the near surface moisture. So moisture is at least as important, if not more important, in terms of its spatial gradients 
than uh, temperature. So this is our estimate. Because my interpretation is, is because, of course, then once the monsoon the gets absolutely, and that is something absolutely. But let me emphasize how this dashed line represent the same meridional temperature gradient now average three months before monsoon onset. Again, for a stronger monsoon year and for a weaker monsoon year. In fact, even in the preceding winter, spring, it's not clear that the temperature contrast is strongest, stronger in a strong monsoon year. But again, that is to emphasize how, and I think that this is accepted, right? The fact that, of course, you have lots of feedbacks, clouds, evaporation from the surface when precipitation gets going. But this is to emphasize there is still plenty of statements in the literature that one robust projection um, in climate models due to, for instance, WCO2 is that land will warm up more than the ocean. And that is not just a transient response. That is an equilibrium response. Hence the monsoonal circulation will strengthen. And in fact, I hope that I'll get there, but I'll show you results from models where precipitation still, go up, still goes up, right? We are in a moister world, so precipitation will go up. But because moisture goes up at a very fast uh, pace, 7% uh, per uh, degree of warming, um, in fact, because we have increased stability, the circulation can weaken. So it's not the near surface temperature gradient that drives the strength of the monsoon. Again, we should go beyond this thinking as temperature gradients being an external forcing to the monsoon. The, exter the temperature gradients are influenced, are affected by what the monsoon is doing. Okay. Again, a convectively coupled view of the circulations. Also true on intraseasonal time scales. If you're interested in how here we define the timing of the onset of a monsoon. Now looking at uh, seasonal transitions, come to my poster next week. This is an off-molar plot. Again, we are averaging in longitude over the monsoon sector, latitude versus time relative to the day of onset for each individual season. This is what the temperature looks like. Again, this large anomalies in temperatures at monsoon onset are clearly coupled to changes in, here we use the equivalent uh, potential temperature in the boundary layer. It's the same thing, more or less, as the uh, moist static energy. The two, the two are strongly, strongly coupled. If we now look at the distribution of near surface temperature, near surface moist static energy, they, at the day of monsoon onset, again, this is an average over several many monsoon seasons. Again, we see, clearly see strong meridional temperature and gradients in both. But if we now look at the change in temperature and change in moist static energy, um, in the 15 days following monsoon onset, we see that moist static energy increases, but temperature decreases at monsoon onset. Again, this view that the near surface temperature drives the monsoonal flow is clearly flawed. You have weaker um, near surface temperature gradients as the monsoonal circulation is strongly intensifying. Okay, so now the other part that I would like to discuss, it's uh, mechanisms for rapid monsoon onset. Um, the rapidity or the abruptness of monsoon onset is something that I haven't discussed so far. Let me show you another animation. Um, this is zooming over the South Asian monsoon region, the vectors. Again, we started, sorry, I'll have to let it loop through several times. We started January 1st. The winds are the lower level winds. The contours are precipitation. These are long-term daily averages. Again, let's start again. Notice over the summer, trade winds blowing from the northeast to the southwest, precipitation over the um, southern uh, near equatorial ocean. Okay, now we're going back to the cold season. Again, notice in the cold season, precipitation likes to sit south of the equator. Notice how now around April, things start to change and start to change very rapidly. May start to change very rapidly. Notice that within two weeks, you really see this strong reversal of the low level flow with the development of this very strong cross equatorial jet called the Somali jet because it's coastally trapped against Somalia. And notice how this strong development and reversal of the winds is accompanied by a really rapid shift in the precipitation patterns that basically jump really rapidly from the near equatorial ocean into the um, subcontinent of India and nearby um, oceans. Again, this, uh, there, you can define nonlinearities in many, in many ways, but here it is clear the changes in the monsoonal circulation and precipitation <coughs> occur on time scales that are much more rapid than what can be interpreted as just the linear response to a very smoothly bearing insulation forcing. 
Another view of the rapid onset, again here I'm showing half molar of precipitation starting January 1st, again only averaged over in the Indian monsoon sector, 60 to 100 degrees east. Again, notice how the beginning of the monsoon season really is accompanied by a rearrangement of this precipitation patterns, primary convergence zone in the um, uh, cold season being south of the equator at the beginning of the warm season something is happening and this convergence zone really shifts very rapidly into the <coughs> subtropical northern hemisphere okay so going back to this very strong statement that I really like to make that really the schematic from Rudeman of monsoons as Seabreeze circulations is not true let me try to provide you more convincing evidence if what I showed you before is not enough and this is work that I've done already 10 years ago. I'm still talking about it. Um, and it's the fact that monsoons can, in fact, be simulated either, even over an aquaplanet. Um, and I would like to emphasize that despite the fact that I really want to focus on theoretical frameworks, so I really don't have time to develop my own interpretation of a hierarchical modeling approach, I use it extensively as part of my research efforts. So these results are based on a GCM that is idealized in many ways. The physics that is represented is very simple. This model does not have cloud, but really one very, very important simplification is the fact that the atmospheric model is coupled to a completely uniform slab ocean. This means that my surface is covered by a completely uniform mixed layer depth with a fixed depth. Okay, it's just a slab of, of water. The, the ocean doesn't move. We are only capturing the thermodynamic coupling. We have at least the, some representation of how the ocean transports energy by imposing a Q flux uh, in the surface, uh, in the mixed um, layer, uh, so in the surface energy budget. Okay, so can we simulate monsoons over? such an aquaplanet. This is again the observations, it's a very similar plot to the one I showed you before. Again, rearrangement of the main convergence zones from near equatorial ocean into subtropical land masses at the beginning of the monsoon uh, season. So now what happens when we look at the simulated seasonal cycle of precipitation over this aquaplanet when we make that slab of ocean very, very shallow? And here, what I mean by shallow, I really mean shallow. This is only a meter actually in fact half a meter of water although a meter doesn't make much difference of course this is not a realistic depth for mixed layer depths in the oceans that are of course it i mean the depth of the mixed layer in the ocean depends on where you are where when and through the seasonal cycle but definitely it's around 20 25 and 50 at times so you can think of this being a planet that is uh, covered by a swamp so it's completely saturated surface but its, it's heat capacity is so small that this um, boundary can adjust rapidly to the seasonally imposed insulation forcing. Okay, so here I would like to argue that despite not having any lengthy contrast, we can simulate monsoon-like transitions in the precipitation patterns in the sense that in this simulation, tropical precipitation tends to be organized along subtropical convergence zones that shift quite rapidly from one summer hemisphere to the opposite summer <coughs> hemisphere. If now you take the same model and increase the mixed layer depth by an order of magnitude, you make it 50, you see that tropical precipitation has a seasonal cycle that is way more muted, um, both in terms of intensity and in terms of, like, of location. The uh, precipitation doesn't like to move much away from the equator when the mixed layer depth is large, whereas when the mixed layer depth is shallow, you see much stronger seasonal migrations at latitudes that are not unlike to what you see in the observations in the Indian monsoon sector. I know that thinking about an aquaplanet is a little bit confusing, so now let me show you a snapshot from the model. This is really just a snapshot. It's a, a five-day average. The winds, I mean, the vectors here represent the low-level winds. Um, this is what the precipitation distribution looks like. Notice that despite being an aquaplanet, at any instance there are zonal variations, but these zonal variations average out when you take longer term averages because longitude doesn't have any meaning, okay? There is no difference in longitude because we have completely <coughs> uniform aquaplanet. And this is again the observations from reanalysis for the month of July, near surface winds precipitation patterns. Again, notice how even despite the fact that I don't have any subtropical land mass, in this simulation I can get a complete reversal of the lower level flows that blows from the south, crosses the equator, blows from the southwest. 
um, and turns at subtropical latitudes very similar to what happens in the Indian monsoon region. And again, notice that even without accounting and let alone topography, the convergence zone can migrate at subtropical latitudes similar to what we see in um, monsoon regions. So you say you don't have a land mass, you have a land mass everywhere. So I have a land, but I don't have the lengthy contrast. Mass. So again, let me maybe go back to this famous schematics that I take issues with, and I, I hope I don't sound too strong. Um, but again, and I also have to say that a lot of work, previous work, has tried to, of course, exactly why is the monsoon onset rapid, especially if you believe. Um, in this, in this view, right, there's nothing non-linear, right? The Lancy control builds up smoothly following the installation forcing. So there must be some non-linearity that gives rise to this rapid monsoon onset. And what does this the relevant non-linearity has been discussed at length? And let me say that in general, though, it is assumed that in any previous work that no matter what the non-linearity is, the fact that you have a land mass that can warm up faster than the surrounding ocean is implicit in all of these previous arguments. I don't have this um, meridional gradient in that surface heat capacity. The heat capacity is everywhere the same. And I'll go back to the role that land, because of course land, I mean, monsoons do develop over land, so land must play a role. And I'm hoping to get there in a minute. Okay, so then how about the overturning circulation associated with this simulation? Again, let me for the time being, show you a snapshot in the middle of the summer for this aquaplanet monsoon. Forget the winds. I'll get back to the winds in a minute. This is the overturning circulation that develops ascending motion in the subtropics. Again, cross equatorial flow. You don't see any summer cell. Most of the precipitation is confined within the ascent of this cross equatorial Hadley cell. Here in the red, I'm showing the moist static energy in the boundary layer. The blue is the precipitation. Again, notice how, well, it's no surprise, we use the we use a quasi-convective uh, AQE um, convection scheme in this model, but notice how the poleward boundary of the circulation is indeed in agreement with the uh, convective quasi-equilibrium view of monsoons. It's co-located with the uh, maximum in moist static energy, located in the subtropics, just the equator word of which most of the precipitation is confined. Again, let me emphasize this. In this situation, we do get a reversed meridional moist static energy or temperature gradient. We are an aqua planet, so temperature and moisture are strongly coupled. But again, in general, the existence of this reverse meridional temperature gradient with temperatures that are warmer at subtropical latitudes than at the equator is interpreted as really arising from, again, the fact that land in the subtropic can warm up relative to the ocean. We don't have any of that imposed gradient in surface properties there, and yet, Thanks, in fact, to also feedbacks with the circulation, we do develop this reverse meridional temperature gradient. There's also been a lot of discussion in the literature about the role that, for instance, elevated mountain ranges, the dependent plateau plays in strengthening that gradient. We don't have any of that in this simulation, and yet we do get a reverse meridional temperature gradient. Okay, so then how do, so what happens? What makes this, what, 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 what gives rise to this non, um, these very rapid monsoon transitions in this model. Again, you flip from, as Jeff was saying, we really flip from one cross equatorial circulation in one hemisphere to the opposite one. Um, so I apologize, but I'm going to spend some time at the board to guide you through what is the current thinking about the nonlinearities implicated in these rapid transitions in the shallow mixed layer depth. But here, let me make a point, because apart from all the math, um, one thing that I want to emphasize is the fact that, of course, so in this view, what is it that we are trying to say? We're trying to say that you don't need the Lancy contrast per se to drive monsoons, but you need land insofar that it provides a boundary with a low enough thermal inertia that it allows for rapid adjustments through interactions with the circulation and, of course, surface fluxes of the lower level moist static energy so that this maximum that controls where precipitation is located and where the polar boundary of the circulation is located can move to subtropical latitudes in a very rapid fashion. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. So then what drives the rapid development of a monsoon in these simulations? Okay, so this is where we go back to angular momentum budget. 
Uh, and I'm not as organized as Jeff, who has all his um, equations on the slides. I also like to derive equations at the board, because as Jeff said, if you look them at slides, you have no idea where they come from. Um, And I apologize because on top of having a strong Italian accent that becomes stronger when I get animated, I also have a terrible handwriting. Um, okay, so then what drives those, uh, what is the nonlinearity in this simulation? So key to this is the angular momentum budget. I won't do it, I'll just write it as zonal momentum budget, but as Jeff said, this is basically equivalent to the angular momentum budget in spherical coordinates, I'm lazy. So I'm going to do everything in local Cartesian coordinates so we don't have to worry about cosines and the likes. OK, so the zonal momentum budget. To make Jeff happy, I'm going to use Z coordinates. I'm not going to use pressure coordinates, but later on, I'll use pressure coordinates. Um, but it's actually the same. OK, so du dt plus advection, u du dx, plus v du dy, plus w du dz, minus fv, Coriolis force at the meridional flow, will have to be balanced by the pressure gradient, the dp dx. We are in the free troposphere, so we don't have any viscous effects, OK? So now we're going to do, and I'm not going to do all of the steps. Um, so we're going to do the following. We're going to do typical Reynolds decomposition and averaging. OK? So every field, like you, for instance, will be decomposed in a zonal and time mean. So the bar here represents both zonal and time mean, plus deviations from this. My deviations now, I'm really thinking as the large scale extratropical eddies that, for instance, we saw in the cloud field. Okay? These are really the large scale extratropical eddies that are doing a lot of the momentum transport outside of the tropics. As all Reynolds averaging, um, of course, then if, for instance, we take a U prime bar, this will, be, this will be equal to zero because the bar is also a zonal mean. DDX of any mean quantity will be equal to zero. Okay? Then we're going to use continuity. Actually, we should use continuity before, but it's fine. Continuity for both, so non-divergent field for both means and prime quantities. Um, and that's it. And so then what I get, if I then take another mean, I get the following equation for the evolution of the zonal mean zonal flow, du bar dt. OK? So then I'll have the advection of the mean flow by the mean flow. The u bar term is not there because any ddx goes away. So I have the meridional advection by the mean flow of mean zonal wind. I have the vertical advection, w bar du bar dz. And then I have the FV bar term. So far, so good, right? Nothing is too surprising. But when, of course, we are doing the averaging, there are the nonlinear terms, the terms that are associated with covariances between basically the fluctuation terms in the nonlinear advective terms do not average it to zero. I'm going to take them on the left hand side. There is no zonal pressure gradient. And this will be equal to minus d dy u prime d prime bar minus d dz u prime w prime bar. OK? So what do these terms represent? These terms represent the convergence, the minus sign here, in the meridional and vertical direction of the zonal momentum in the meridional and vertical direction, OK? So this is, again, the meridional westerly momentum convergence. And this is the uh, um, vertical convergence of westerly momentum. Again, these um, are really arises from covariances of fluctuations between eddies field. Any eddy field individually averages to 0. 
but fluctuations do not average to zero. And those, again, are associated with fluxes of westerly momentum by meridional fluctuations and by vertical fluctuations. Yes? Say it again? U bar is time average. The bar is over the fluctuations. U bar means zonal and time average. Yes, bar. Yes, let me write it. Zonal and time average. Yes. The what? The? the first term, du bar by dt, should also be zero. No, the only thing that goes to zero is the ddx. But you are also doing time average. What is it that goes to zero? No, that is the, the mean. The mean can be slowly evolving. It's the u prime that when time average goes to zero. OK? We're going to do look at steady states. But this is exactly telling you that apart from these terms that we understand, advection by the mean and the Coriolis force, <coughs> in fact, convergence of momentum by large-scale eddies can give rise to a westerly tendency, OK? Questions? OK, so again, here the goal is really thinking about, let me schematically represent again the Hadley cells in a very schematic way. I'm going to put the equator here. We're going to try to understand the existence of upper level and the direction of upper level meridional flow in the Hadley cells, OK? And we also use some arguments to explain, for instance, the direction of the flow in the extratropics at upper levels in the Farrell cells, OK? OK, another way in which we can rewrite it is by noting that the relative vorticity, the vertical component of the relative vorticity is dv dx minus du dy. So when we take a zonal and time average, this term goes to 0. So again, notice how now we can rewrite the advection term in terms of a meridional vorticity flux. OK? And again, this is an equation that Jeff did show yesterday in his slides. I think for statistically studied states, so I think he put the du bar dt to 0. But then I have, again, du bar dt. F plus z bar, notice that this is the absolute vorticity, the sum of the relative and the planetary vorticity multiplied by the mean meridional flow. I have the vertical advection that I will draw up in a minute. And then I have, again, the d dy u prime d prime bar minus d dz u prime w prime bar. Okay. Okay, let me say that we can interpret this as the meridional absolute vorticity flux. Okay, then um, what can we say about the eddy momentum flux, convergence, and divergence patterns in the extratropics and in the tropics? It turns out that this is really the most important term. The vertical term is really important only in the boundary layer. So again, this represents how these large-scale eddies that are primarily generated in bar through baroclinic instability in mid-latitudes are transporting angular momentum, or in this case, the um, westerly uh, momentum. Um, and these are things that uh, Ingsik did cover in his lecture. I'm going to just draw schematically the end result. In fact, all of this is actually the focus on a 10-week class that I teach. Um, so I'm really trying to summarize in 10 minutes what I do in a much longer uh, time. But again, what actually, so again, let me emphasize that where we have, going back to this equation, that where we have a westerly convergence by the eddies, where minus d dy u prime v prime is positive, again, this is convergence, of westerly momentum by the extratropical eddies, because again, they are depositing momentum in the region where there is net convergence. They provide a westerly tendency on the mean zonal flow. Okay, corresponds to westerly tendency. Uh, the opposite, of course, would be true where there is net divergence. Uh, with the minus sign, sorry for the confusion. <laughs> um, let me do this then so that I don't confuse anybody. Uh, 
because the divergence is positive, defined this way. Uh, <laughs> because what appears there is the convergence, the divergence, will be an easterly tendency on the mean flow. OK, so then it turns out that this that really behaves a large scale Rossby waves really live um, because of the existence of a meridional gradient in the absolute vorticity are such that they actually tend, and I don't know how to represent this, there are very nice schematics in Jeff's books, but they are generated in the extratropics as they start propagating both poleward and upward they actually tend to converge momentum in the region where they originate. Okay, so again, they propagate meridionally outside of the source region. And it turns out that again, in the source region, there is net convergence of westerly momentum. Where these waves break at either higher or lower latitudes, there is net divergence. Of momentum. Okay, so where these baroclinic eddies are generated, you would expect a westerly tendency on the mean flow. And again, this is really at the at the core of theories for the development of jets in extra uh, tropical atmospheres. And one of the reasons is really, as in, in Sequos, um was discussing how the lines of constant phases. Are, are tilted as these waves propagate outside of the source region, again, here being where our clinic instability will determine them, their faces are tilted from the um, northwest to the southeast, north of the source region. They're tilted in the opposite direction. And so this results in negative momentum. So westerly momentum transported southward, north of the source region. U prime, V prime will be positive south of the source region. Again, this results in net convergence. And that is, I can't draw it, but INSIC did a very nice job. But basically, you can look at the correlation between the U prime and V prime fluctuations and convince that this is the case. So just, is the transport of V person is very important. Is there an explanation for this tilt? Yes, if you, you that's in SIC did provide. It's a theoretical explanation. You can use it. You can actually, there are different ways of trying to explain this. Um, Rossby wave theory will, will give this. this yeah, yeah, right. I don't know if there is any intuitive. We would have to go through some derivations, but there's, yes. I think one way of thinking about it is that if you've got a circular eddy, Yes, nothing is happening. You need... U prime, V prime... Will be zero. Is average to zero. On the equatorial side, beta is larger. Yes. So the eddies have a more Rossby wave effect. And, so and in fact, you... end up looking like banana, sh banana shapes. Yeah. Which is that, that tilt. That tilt here. OK, and I will show you plots of the fact that, in fact, we do see this. Um, how this, okay? So where these um, waves are generated, they converge momentum. Where they're dissipated, they diverge uh, momentum. These waves also tend to behave as barotropic Rossby waves. They like to propagate in regions of upper level westerlies. And they, again, break and dissipate where they meet their critical latitude. For simplicity, just where the U does all, means on a wind goes to zero, okay? Okay, great. So then now let's do some more simplifications to the zonal momentum budget. Um, we're going to look at statistically steady states. So we're going to put, as was suggested before, the DU bar DT. Oh, I should not have, uh, if you can still see my schematic of the Hadley cell and the Farrell cells. What we're going to assume is the fact that we're going to be looking at, um, again, we are looking at the free troposphere. So we're going to be looking, so this is the Farrell, this is Hadley, this is Hadley, this is the Farrell. We're going to be looking at regions of upper level flow in the uh, upper branches of the circulations where more or less the flow is primarily meridional. So if you look at the stream function, the stream function, the lines of the stream function are parallel, to, for instance, pressure contours, which means that their vertical velocity is small and we can neglect this term. Okay? So then, again, the uh, zonal momentum budget simply becomes 
and I'm going to change the sign, a balance between the meridional flux by possibly the mean meridional circulation of absolute vorticity and the eddy momentum flux divergence, d dy, u prime, v prime bar. OK? OK, so let's go back and think about the Heldenhau model that, um, of the Hadley circulation that um, Jeff discussed yesterday. All of those theories are based on axisymmetry. What it means is that they completely neglect any fluctuations in longitudes. In the Heldenhau model, there is no eddies whatsoever. Okay? So in axisymmetric theories, such as the, the Heldenhau, By construction, the right hand side is zero. Okay? We don't consider any, it's really a two dimensional theory of the Hadley circulation. So, angular momentum conservation is the, simply a statement that F plus Z bar V bar is equal to zero. So, how can this be verified? Two ways. And the way we want is that to have, so one is V is equal to zero, right? But we want a model for the Hadley cell, so we want in a returning with V bar less different than zero, right? And so then the only way in which this angular momentum budget is verified is for the absolute vorticity, again, in the upper branch of this Hadley cell, to be equal to zero. So why this, is this equivalent to a statement of conservation of angular momentum? It is because the absolute vorticity is proportional to the meridional gradient of the angular momentum. So zero meridional gradients of angular momentum means that an air parcel that moves along a streamline in the upper branch of the Hadley cell is moving along contours of con angular momentum. OK? Is this clear? So angular momentum, as Jeff described yesterday, this is the Absolute, uh, the angular momentum per unit mass around the Earth's spin axis has a planetary component omega is squared cosine squared of theta plus a relative component u bar a cosine of theta. What are all these terms? Again, if we go back to our sphere, this is our planet. We are considering a ring of parcels. Again, zonal symmetry at the latitude theta. Their distance from the axis of rotation is A cosine of theta. If we also make the thin shell approximation, any parcel in the atmosphere will be 10 kilometers from the surface, which is much smaller than the radius of our planet. OK? So this is the thin shell approximation. So again, in addition to the fact that, of course, this air parcel rotates together with the planet, it may also have an additional component associated with the direction of the westerly wind. OK? And again, uh, Jeff yesterday described uh, the angular momentum conserving winds, for instance, for a Hadley cell in which air rises right at the equator in a region of negligible zonal winds. Those angular momentum conserving winds are equal to omega a sine square of theta divided by the cosine of theta. And so they increase, the angular momentum conserving winds increase with latitude. And why is that the case? It's really a very simple concept of conservation of angular momentum. And let's suppose we are in our parcel that starts here at the equator with zero zonal mean wind as it moves along latitudes, its distance from the axis of rotation will decrease, right? Um, to conserve angular momentum, because its distance from the axis of rotation is decreasing, it will want to spin faster, exactly the same way in which a skater, and Katrina knows that very well, because she used to be an ice, or maybe she's still an ice skater, and a skater starts uh, um, spinning with uh, her arms wide open, as she brings her arms closer, she spins faster because she's decreasing her moment of inertia. And so she, can spin, she spins faster to conserve angular momentum. That's exactly what is happening to this parcel that moving meridionally is getting closer to the axis of rotation. And for it spinning faster means acquire, acquiring a westerly component relative to the solid body rotation. OK? OK, so in this. Uh, and that is, again, Heldenhau is really based on assuming that the angular momentum conserving winds, that the winds in the upper um, 
triple CR angular momentum conserving, and that is really from this basic angular momentum budget, a requirement for angular momentum to be conserved. Um, and then other properties of the Hadley circulations follow through, for instance, assumption of conservation of energy within the cell and continuities of temperatures at the edges of the uh, cell. Okay, so um, the other thing that I want to maybe define is something that we, it's a local Rossby number, a local Rossby number rho naught defined as the um, ratio change sign of the relative to the planetary vorticity. Again, that, that means that the absolute vorticity can be rewritten as F that multiplies one minus this Rossby number. So notice that angular momentum conservation implies the limit Rossby number going to one. Okay? This is a local Rossby number because it has your traditional scaling of a Rossby number, right? Vorticity, relative vorticity divided by the planetary vorticity is local because it depends on the local value of F. Okay? So large Rossby numbers, we are, as probably would expect in the tropics, this is not a limit that is going to be valid in the extra tropics. Okay? This is a nonlinear limit. Right? In this, the maintenance of this angular momentum budget, the, this term that basically represents the advection of relative momentum by the mean meridian circulation takes a dominant role. Okay? This is a nonlinear uh, momentum budget. Okay, so then, uh, questions? Okay, so then, I don't know where to write anymore. Let's look at another limit that we might think of, again, let me rewrite the zonal momentum budget as F that multiplies 1 minus rho naught V bar, approximately balanced by the eddy momentum flux divergence, D dy U prime V prime. Okay, now let's suppose that we are in the mid-latitudes. In the mid-latitudes, we know that the Rossby number, oh, sorry, is much less than 1. Right? It's really the fact that F uh, becomes important. So in the extratropics, this limit becomes F V bar balanced by the eddy momentum flux <coughs> divergence. Okay, so notice how I have a little bit of a hard time calling it literally a linear limit because, of course, you have to be able to say something about the eddy fluxes. But to the extent that we know how to parametrize the eddy fluxes, maybe through down gradient diffusion, although that might be maybe debatable for momentum, for Western momentum, but putting that aside, basically this limit is a limit in which the strength of the circulation is really slaved by the eddy momentum flux divergence, okay? Uh, in the sense that any change in the eddy momentum flux uh, divergence will have to be balanced by changes in the mean meridiana circulation, possibly by shifts in the cell and the relevant value of F. So this is the limit that holds in the Farrell cells. In the Farrell cells that are sitting in the extra tropics, this is where we have net convergence of eddy momentum flux because these are our source regions for these eddies that are generated there. So these eddies are converging westerly momentum in these regions, and so the westerly acceleration due to the eddy momentum flux convergence there needs to be balanced by equator flow in both hemispheres, okay? So easterly acceleration by the Coriolis force on the equatorial flow at both levels in both hemispheres, okay? So that is why in one of my first slides I said the Farrell cells are really eddy driven. They exist because they are driven by eddy momentum flux convergence um, there. Uh, a bit relevant for the Farrell cell. Again, for F positive, you can balance the convergence. You need V negative, equator flow. Same thing for F negative southern hemisphere. V needs to be positive, also equator flow. And this is what sustains this indirect cells. OK, 
Okay, so then the, let's say that we understand these two limits fairly well, right? This limit is somewhat, I don't want to say simple, but again, we need to be able to say something about the eddies, to say something about the strength of the circulation. In this limit, well, if the circulation needs to exist, all we need to know is that once it exists, it will want to conserve angular momentum. Also notice that when the circulation is angular momentum conserving, this, the angular momentum budget does not provide any constraint on the strength of the cell, right? Once f plus z bar is equal to zero, it's really a trivial balance, zero equals zero. It doesn't tell you anything about the strength of the circulation. We will have to use another balance to say something about the strength of the circulation. That is, for instance, the energy balance, okay? So an angular momentum conserving circulation is also strongly energetically constrained. Okay, so then the question is, where is the Hadley cell sitting in observations? And the truth is that is probably not in the regime of axisymmetric theories as we maybe uh, would have expected or hoped for. Oh, I forgot to say something, but I'll return to that in a minute. And that is exactly from observations, from reanalysis, <clears throat> a schematic showing the seasonal evolution, DJF, uh, JJA, so these are the solstice seasons, the uh, equinox seasons. The color, again, this is the circulation, color contours represent at the momentum flux divergence in warm colors, convergence in blue. Unfortunately, it's cut out here, but basically those are your regions of generation of, um, of um, large-scale eddies. Um, the shading here represents regions where the Rossby number is larger than 0 0.5. So notice that in the equinox season, Rossby numbers tend to be small almost everywhere, right? Rossby number small, if anything, is closer to the extratropical limit than the axisymmetric limit, okay? Also notice how this summer cells, here you don't see a summer cell, these summer cells are really not angular momentum conserving at all. Rossby numbers in the upper branches of the summer cells are really very, very small. Maybe where these angular momentum conserving theories start being relevant is in the strong cross-equatorial Hadley cell, especially the solstitial Hadley cell, especially for northern hemisphere summer. And this is what Jeff yesterday tried schematically to say that probably the angular momentum conserving limit is not relevant that much for the annual mean, for sure not in the summer cells, more so in the cross-equatorial winter cells, and actually it's even more so in monsoonal circulations. I haven't figured out a good way to show this, but maybe one way that might be convincing is looking at the streamlines of the circulation at upper levels uh, in the monsoon region. Notice how this is a very strong, broad anticyclone. F in the subtropics is not insignificant. This is an anticyclonic relative vorticity that is part, largely capable to balance F so that you start approaching conservation of angular momentum. Of course, when you really go from axisymmetry to a three-dimensional circulation, things are a little bit more complicated. But there is evidence that, in fact, PV tends to approach zero within the center of this um, anticyclone. Okay, so can I just say one more thing and then we'll break? So one thing that I forgot to mention, and that is something that, because it will be important for what I'm gonna be discussing later on. Um, again, let's go back to the cross-equatorial Hadley cell picture from Linzen and Howe. This is also completely axisymmetric, but instead of considering uh, annual forcing, it considers a forcing that is off equatorial. In this case, the forcing maximizes as phi naught. Again, the picture that emerges is a stronger cross-equatorial winter cell and a weaker summer cell. In this solution, notice how the poleward extent of this, um, uh, the dividing branch 
between the two cells is actually at a latitude larger than the forcing, despite the fact that the ascent tends to remain concentrated closer to the forcing. And it turns out that you need to, this extra parameter to solve for to close your system uh, of equations. So the important thing in this case, again, we also assume in this case that in the upper branches of the circulations, angular momentum is conserved, but now it's the angular momentum of air parcel originating from the surface negligible winds goes up. So the angular momentum conserving winds for this cross equatorial Hadley cell is equal to omega A cosine squared of theta one, sorry, Linzen and how you spy, I'm using theta to be consistent with Jeff's notation rest today, minus the cosine squared of latitude divided by the cosine of latitude. So what does this distribution look like? It is exactly this. These are the angular momentum conserving winds for a cell whose phi one is right where the winds go to zero. The important thing that I want to emphasize is the fact that for a cross equatorial Hadley cell, the zonal wind distribution is symmetric about the equator, but the interesting thing is that they start having upper level easterlies in a broad latitudinal band, and in fact, between phi one, or oh, theta one, which is the latitude of the poleward boundary of the cross equatorial Hadley cell, and the minus uh, theta one. And through thermal wind balance, you need to develop a reverse meridional temperature gradient to balance the easterly wind shear. Minimum at the equator, maxima in the subtropics, and exactly where the zonal wind goes to zero. I'll stop here. Uh, we're going to use these arguments to understand the aquaplanet simulations, and we're going to be back at around 11. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Certamente, assolutamente. Certamente.